Hey guys, and welcome back. It's so great to see everybody again this week. In this video, our focus is focusing. And it's one of the easiest things to take for granted, but one of the most impactful things that can make or break your shot. So today I'm gonna to share with you some camera settings and some tricks I use out in the field that can help you nail focus and have way more hits than misses as you continue to take your photography to the next level. So grab a cup of coffee and those reading glasses and let's dive in. Okay, so I was only half joking about the readers, guys. More on that in just a little bit. This is part three of my Basics of Photography series. Now, if you happen to miss part one or two, I'll put a link to those down in the description so you can catch up. And also, I highly recommend that you download my mobile guide. I'll put a link to that in the description as well. This is packed with useful information from the first two lessons as well as what we're going to cover today. And I find that it works best if you put it in books on your iPhone or a PDF reader so that you can interact with it. Now, if you enjoy learning about photography, I suggest subscribing to my channel. Or if you just like going with me on my adventures, subscribe and invite your friends to do the same so that we can all continue on this adventure and becoming better photographers. Now in part one of the series, we talked about camera basics and setup and we discussed composition. In part two, we talked about nailing exposure and capturing your artistic vision. Now with both of these, they're pretty forgiving. You know, if you have a composition that you didn't quite nail out in the field, you can get in Lightroom or Photoshop and you can actually crop that and really improve drastically that composition. Now, if you happen to miss the exposure a little bit, maybe you're underexposed, maybe you're overexposed, with a raw file, you can push that in either direction and it's pretty forgiving. But today, we're talking about focusing. Now, this one's less forgiving because if you don't nail focus when you're out in the field or with your subject, I hate to tell you, but you've missed the boat. There's really nothing you can do in post or in editing that will bring back focus. Now sure, there's sharpening and things that you can do in Photoshop and Lightroom, but that still will not fix a shot that's poorly focused. So today, that's what we've got to figure out. Now how do you do this? There's some definite things we can do with our camera to make sure that we're nailing focus more often than not. Now the first thing I want to say about focusing is just not to forget focusing. Because as soon as you forget about it, you're going to miss focus. Now, it's especially true when we're coming from phones. We're used to just holding this thing up and taking pictures. It has facial recognition. It kind of tries to find faces and pull those in focus. We can tap to focus and it'll put a little box around what we want. But I got a question. How often do you actually look at those shots on a screen that's larger than the phone you took it on? Chances are you're not printing these big, right? Well, when you go and start shooting on an actual big camera, the idea is that you're doing that so that you can print them large and look at them big with all that glorious detail. Well, when you're shooting, you're looking at a screen that's often way smaller than your phone screen. And you cannot trust, let me repeat that, you cannot trust this little screen because everything that looks sharp and in focus on this screen because of the compressed resolution does not mean that it actually is in focus. You have to punch in, zoom in on that picture, and review and look to see if you're in focus. I've done entire photo shoots before with a model where the lighting was perfect, the composition was perfect. She was giving me all sorts of great expressions and great looks and everything, and it wasn't until I got back on the computer that I saw that I had her eyes in soft focus. I was using a really, really shallow depth of field. You know what that is now? I was shooting at like a 2.8, razor thin area of depth of focus, and I just missed her eye. On the camera though, it looked tack sharp, so I thought I was nailing everything. So rule number one is do not trust that little screen on the back of your camera because it will lie to you. Now here's where these readers come in, okay? Now these little mirrorless cameras are absolutely phenomenal and the screens continue to get better and better. I'm blown away with my Nikon Z6 and Z7 that I'm filming with right now on both of these cameras. But those screens are only as good as you can see them as a viewer. 
And I find it especially challenging now that I've turned 40. I'm out doing astrophotography. I'm looking at that screen. I've got manual focus and I'm trying to find that one little star and pull that guy in focus. And I find myself just squinting and blinking and trying to see, is that truly in focus or is it my eyes that are out of focus? And so having those readers and being able to pinpoint your focus is gonna be hugely important as you start developing as a landscape photographer. You wanna to get to the minutia and find every little detail of focus. And so you have to be able to see that. Another thing I'll say is don't forget this little diopter on your camera because as you're looking through the camera too and you got it up to your face, you wanna make sure that you're seeing clearly or else you're gonna miss focus. And that's what this is all about. You have to be able to see in order to nail focus. So when it comes to shooting people, the general rule is always look at the eye. We have to make sure their eye is in focus. And a good rule of thumb is to always focus on the eye that's closest to the camera. So if I'm turned this way, you'd focus on this eye. If I'm turned this way, you'd focus on this eye. And we're pretty forgiving with the back eye going a little soft if someone's looking off and, and you focus on that corner of their eye that's closest to the camera and this one happens to go out of focus a little bit. We're pretty forgiving on that. But having neither eye in focus is not acceptable. And if you have a subject where maybe they have a hair or a wedding veil and one of their eyes is obscured by that, then focus on the one that's n the least obscured as a general rule. Now you can, of course, do artistic things, but I'll find more often than not, it's really good when you have that eye in tack sharp focus. Now, what if you're shooting landscapes? We're gonna talk about some of the different camera settings and your camera, it's pretty advanced. There's some really cool auto focus features as well as manual focus features and we're gonna cover how to weigh out how to use either one of those, which one you want to use, and how to nail that. So I just went out to my pasture to do a little demo. All right, we're out in my pasture in front of my favorite quince tree. Now recently I've started doing a landscape study of this tree for a few reasons. Number one, it's really close to my house. I can see this tree out of my windows and my office. So if there's really cool weather or clouds behind this thing or good light quality on this tree, I can just grab my camera, come out here, set up and get a composition and take a cool shot of this tree. So I encourage you to do the same thing. Find a tree or a building or something cool around you that's really, really close and study that as the weather and as the light changes, you go out and take shots of that same subject over and over from different angles and it will really help you with your photography. Now I took an interest in this tree because I bought this land from Kelsey's family, my wife's family, and her grandpa grew up coming out here and as a young boy he would jump the fence and sneak across this pasture to go to that big pond over there to go fishing and maybe shoot his rifle, shoot some turtles, target practice, whatever. But he says this tree has looked the exact same since he was seven or eight year old boy. He's 98 now. So I'm thinking, how old is this tree? And I haven't seen it grow much since I bought the property a few years ago. It's looked virtually the same as long as I can remember visiting this farm. So there's no telling how old this tree truly is. But that's also kind of a cool thing when you buy land or you visit land the story goes way, way, way past your arriving there. So I'm just documenting a few tiny moments of this tree's long, long legacy. And today this tree is the focus of our focus study. So let me tell you what I've got set up here. I have my Z7 and right now I've got the little screen on top so that you can follow along and see what I see through the camera as we go through these different focusing modes. So to start with, I have it on autofocus, continuous, which means it's literally trying to find focus. See, it's on AFC continuous and it's on auto area mode. Okay, so let's test that out. When would you want that? Let's just say you're shooting action sports. Let's say you're shooting a football game or you're shooting a, a bride and her uh, groom as they're walking and they're smiling at each other and you want to really be able to track their faces and make sure you get the most out of your shots. 
Let's see if it tracks my face. Okay, I'm in front of the camera now. Let's see if it acquired me. Did it acquire me? I'm pretty sure it did. It may even be acquiring my eye. Is it acquiring an eye? See, I upgraded to the new firmware on this Z7, this 2.0, and it's supposed to have really good facial tracking and recognition. It's if I move around, you know, kind of give it something, a moving target. What if it's a moving target? Is it working? Yeah, it probably is. I hope it is. But anytime you have a target where you're having to quickly acquire the autofocus capabilities of these cameras have gotten incredible over the last couple of years. But if you have a stationary target like this quince tree, let me show you a couple other options. I'm gonna go in here and change that from autofocus continuous to autofocus single. That means it's only gonna focus when I hit the autofocus button and I'm gonna change the area mode to single point autofocus. Now you'll see I've got a little box. I can take that little box and move it around and if I hit AF on, it'll acquire focus exactly where I put that box. So let's just take a couple of shots here. Here's uh, one, I'm looking at my histogram. Do we want to be at um, one over 60? Yeah, we want to expose to the right of that histogram. So let's just go ahead and take that shot. And then let's go ahead and focus on the trees in the horizon. And let's take that shot. And then we can also come down here and we can focus on the grass in the extreme foreground. Let's focus on that. And as you're shooting something like this tree, you can set your, your focus on a kind of a nice center point of that tree and take that shot. But what if you really want to maximize your focus from the front of the scene all the way to the back? It's one thing just to set your focus point on a subject, but as landscape photographers, we may want to take a little bit more control of that and go into manual focus. So let me show you what that would entail. We're going to go into our camera settings. We're going to go down to instead of autofocus single we're going to go to manual focus and now you see this part's grayed out because that doesn't matter now all right now here's where it really gets interesting we can do two things we can go to infinity focus now which if i punch in you'll see my little uh, scale pop up it's got the flower and it's got the infinity symbol and I can go over here to these trees and just make sure that I'm focused to infinity. See that branch right there? Let's look at that branch. I'm gonna go past infinity and you'll see it kind of go a little bit fuzzy. See there? We can go too far. And I can bring it back down to infinity and if I start to go beneath infinity, you'll see that scale start to move. There we go. I'm gonna bring it right back up, right to infinity and I'm looking at those leaves. I'm trying to see how crispy I can make those leaves. And we just picked up about two stops of light. Do you see that? So always watch that histogram, remember? So let's back out of here and let's see what our histogram is saying. Well, it's not terrible, but I do think we might want to go up to at least an 80th of a second. It looks like we're right on the edge. I can probably still shoot at one over 60. Let's see. That'll really expose that histogram to the right. We're gonna take that shot. In a pinch, I always use infinity. That's kind of my secret rule, secret sauce. The reason I, I would say infinity is because the other way I wanna show you is doing what we call finding your hyperfocal distance. Now I'm gonna use a tape measure for that, which I just forgot in the truck. I'll be back so fast. Okay, let me dive in here on hyperfocal distance because this is a term that I had never even heard of until I started doing landscape photography. Don't be intimidated by this. All it means is that you're focusing to an area that's a little shallower than infinity so that you maximize the amount of your shot that's acceptably sharp. You're just trying to get a little bit more of that foreground to be acceptably sharp than just focusing on the distant mountains or trees. 
Now, what acceptably sharp means is that, of course, everything in your shot isn't going to be tack sharp because there's a graduation of focus and sharpness. Now, there's gonna be a part of your shot that is tack sharp, and that's hopefully the subject that you're looking at. But we wanna be able to have a little bit of that foreground to be acceptably sharp too, so there's no distractions and you can get into that shot and go all the way through it and enjoy it from front to back. And I'm back, I got my trusty tape measure. When you're measuring for your hyperfocal distance, you can actually go onto your app, Photo Pills, and I'll show you exactly how that works. I'm gonna start a little clip here so that you can actually, a screen recording so you can see what I see on my phone too. So if we launch Photo Pills, we're gonna pull up our hyperfocal table, and I'm gonna check my camera settings. Right now, I'm at 20 on my lens. I'm zoomed into 20 and I'm at F11. So let's go to F11. That tells me that I can go three feet 11 inches away from that lens and that's my hyperfocal distance. So let's just test this out. I'll stop this for a second because we know our settings. And if I go three feet 11 inches away, that's not very far. That's this far away from the camera. It's this grass right here. It's literally this grass. So I'll set this here as kind of a marker, a visual reference. Wish I could get it to uh, stay. I'll put it here. Okay, maybe I can see that from the camera. So technically, if I unlock here and I go down at these settings, if I punch in, it's telling me that if I focus on this grass, three feet, 11 inches, there's my hyperfocal distance. Now, one thing I will say about hyperfocal distance is Find that spot, and you can guesstimate. You don't have to have a tape measure. I'm doing it a little bit more of a scientific way, but you can sort of just guesstimate. Go a little bit past that, <clears throat> even up to infinity, somewhere in there. From that hyperfocal distance, find out for you what is acceptably sharp for your foreground, your subject and middle ground, and those distant mountains or trees that you have in the background. Now, if you're up on a tripod, what I find in most cases, I'm six foot tall. So if I'm shooting on a wide angle lens, chances are I'm outside, I've got lots of light. I'm probably using a higher aperture. Even if I don't have a lot of light, I'll just drag that shutter down. But I'm probably gonna be at F8, F11. And at those settings with a wide angle lens and a the smaller aperture, I find that the closest objects in front of my lens are well past that hyperfocal distance. Now I know from the hyperfocal table that anything half the distance of your hyperfocal distance to infinity is going to be acceptably sharp. But remember, if you focus even one inch closer than that, then your background's definitely going to be out of focus. It's going to go soft. So let's see how that looks. If we focus right on hyperfocal distance, and then we come back up and we just test to see what our, our distant trees look like. Now see, we're right at that hyperfocal distance. So we need to go a little bit deeper into the scene. And then I can get those trees in the background more acceptably sharp. And you can see we're just inside of infinity. So let's back out, let's recompose our tree. Get us a decent composition here, remember our rule of thirds. And let's take that shot and see if we prefer that. Now it takes a little bit of time to think through, calculate your hyperfocal distance. You can kind of memorize them after a while. But like I said, in a pinch, say you're going after a neat sunset, you arrive, the lighting is perfect. Do you really want to go through the trouble of finding your hyperfocal distance? I don't think so. I think your safest bet out in the field, nine times out of 10, is absolutely to go to infinity. 
And then here's another trick you can do, and we'll talk way more about this in the future, about focus stacking. Say that we had something really close to the lens and there's no way that that would work with hyperfocal distance. Well, what you do is you take one image where you're focused on that extreme foreground element, you take another one where you're focused on your tree, you take another one when you're focused on those distant trees, and then in post, we can, in editing, I call it post because I'm a film guy, but in editing we can actually composite those together and mask out each section so that we give the illusion of sharp focus from front to back. Now how would we do that? We've got two ways of doing it. We can do it manually, we can do manual focus, or check this out, we can go back to our single point AF and we can start our composition by grabbing focus of our infinity, which right now that represents those trees out there. We'll take that shot. We can take a shot that makes sure we have our subject in perfect focus, which would be this tree. Then we can take another shot. We can just keep moving this closer down into the scene. We can take this shot of the grass after we acquire focus. And then we can get one in the extreme foreground so now we have all the elements of our recipe to have a sharp photo from front to back. The main thing is, when you're out in the field, take several tries to make sure you've got your focus right. Because the last thing you want is to assume that you have everything in focus, only to get home and find out that it's not. So when you're out here, while you're here, shoot and review your shots. Look at them from top to bottom really punch in and zoom in on that photo and see what is in focus and what's working and then adjust it according to what you think is acceptably sharp. And with these little tricks, practice these and you're gonna be a master at focus. Okay, let's unpack focusing just a little bit more. Now there's some modes that you saw me skipping over that I did not discuss and that's just because I don't use them like ever. See, largely, I want to make the decision on what I want in focus, and I don't want a computer or a camera trying to tell me what it thinks that I want in focus. It's all part of that artistic vision. 99% of the time, if I'm not in manual focus, I'm using that single point AF so that I can move that little box around, tell it what I want to be in focus, activate focus, and take my shot. And it's really, really fast to do that. On my Nikons, I actually even have a setting beyond just single point, and it's pinpoint. And I've used that in portraits before where I have somebody locked off and I really want to make sure that I get their eye in focus and I can set this tiny little pin right on their eye and just make sure that they're in sharp focus. Because if you have the regular box, it could maybe hit the nose a little bit or the hair if there's really contrasty hair in their face. And so that pinpoint gives me that pinpoint accuracy. It's a little slower though, so I only use it sparingly, but I have used that. Okay, so the main takeaway here is just to get into your camera and learn those settings. Find out what the limitations are of your autofocus settings and master manual focus too. Because when you get out in the field, you wanna be able to find that composition, get your exposure set, and nail focus fast. And the only way to get there is to practice. Now let's talk about a camera setting we've kinda of skipped over a little bit until now, and that is white balance. Now God has made our eyes incredibly dynamic. We can be out in a full sunny day and then go into an office building under fluorescent lighting, go down to a basement in tungsten lighting, and everything kind of looks natural. We can just take those color changes like champs. And we don't realize that we're changing color temperatures that much until we actually look on the back of our camera. Have you ever taken a shot that just looked really blue? or really gold, you know, people can even have that jaundice look, you know, they're so yellow. That's because we're changing the source of light in different temperatures, and we measure that on the Kelvin scale. So a candlelight can be super, super warm, and then natural daylight can be, you know, neutral, uh, moonlight can be neutral, and you may have noticed like at the end of the day how the light changes or if you're taking pictures of someone in the shade, how it can go super cool, like blue. I've taken shots before of people in the shade where their face is really cool and blue and grave and, and then the background still be warm and golden. So how do we make sense of this? I went out to Broken Bow and did a little demo on white balance. So let's take a look.
Okay, let's talk about white balance. Right now, I'm set for 5600 Kelvin, which is the same as natural sunlight. That's balance for full on sun conditions. And what I recommend is to make sure that you're getting your white balance as close to what you naturally see with your eye while you're out on the location in camera. Of course, you can change it in post, but it's not gonna be as natural colors as if you can get it balanced in camera. So what if we take our white balance way down? Let's just look at going to 3200 Kelvin and taking that same picture. Wow, that's really cold looking. And then what if I go by contrast, let's go up to 7200 and take that. It's just not the natural light that I see. So try to get your white balance as close as you can to natural. You can go through some of the camera presets. If you have an overcast day, you can, of course, click the little cloudy symbol. And if you're in full sun, of course, you can hit the sunny symbol and you can probably get close. But you definitely don't want to do a panorama or anything on auto white balance because as you move the camera, the white balance can literally incrementally change. And what will happen is that your camera will give you a different value from one shot to the next. And as you move around, you don't want all of your, your images in post-production to have different white balances because then you can't copy and paste settings on down the line. See, if you lock in your white balance, then you have a lot more ease of editing in post later on. So work with your camera and understand your white balance settings. Now, 99% of the time, I like to physically dial in a specific Kelvin degree temperature because I want it to be consistent, especially when I'm shooting those panos. I don't want the color temperature to change. Now, auto white balance has come an exceptionally long way, and it's a good thing because in this day and age, we are under so many different types of lighting that we're not talking just a shift between warm and cool. We're talking about magenta green shift. Fluorescent lights have been notorious to have a green tint for years. And some of these LEDs now, everything's sort of going that way. A lot of LEDs also have poor balance between the greens and the magentas. Now I learned a little bit about this because I tried starting a lighting company a few years ago to manufacture LED lights for film and video. It was a failed business because the source where I got my LED chips weren't up to the industry standards on CRI, and that's called Color Rendering Index. And what that means is the measure of how well a light will actually render natural tones. Now tungsten light, even though it's golden, still has a pretty high CRI because we can balance that color out and we still have rich warm skin tones. Now, my chips ended up having a little bit lacking on the red phosphors, so therefore the greens were a little bit high, and none of the Hollywood DPs really wanted my lighting because they didn't want to have to deal with that in post. But guess what? The lighting that's lighting me right now are some of the remnants of my lighting company, and these chips were sort of the last generation that I got with a little bit higher CRI. So how's it looking, huh? How's my skin? Skin tone's looking all right? Yeah, pretty good. So I only bring this up to say that we're under incredibly vastly different colors of light from time to time. And I find that those auto white balance not only will gauge whether it's too warm or too cool, but it'll also kind of balance out those magentas and greens. So don't underestimate either the power of auto white balance if you just get in a pinch. So now you have basically all of the fundamentals of photography. We've covered all the bases. So now it's just a matter of getting your camera and practicing getting out in the field. Work through composition. Work through making sure you have your camera set up properly. Work through that artistic vision we discussed. Figure out what kind of depth of field you're gonna need for your shot. Figure out your exposure. Figure out what aperture and shutter speed you're gonna need based on the light conditions that you have. And also figure out what white balance you need. Now this may seem overwhelming, it may seem like a daunting task to keep it all in your head, but I promise you, if you just keep after it, you'll master it and it will get easier. I wanna encourage you just to take that camera and get out there and shoot more because sooner or later it will become like second nature. 
Now I'm faced with the exact same challenges that you are. This week, I found a composition that I really was interested in shooting that presented a ton of challenges. I was walking along my pond and I saw this amazing patch of lily pads. And it was just out in the water far enough where I knew I couldn't shoot it from the dry ground. I would have to venture out into that water. And you know from some of my previous videos that if you go out in one of my ponds, you're not alone. There could be snakes out there, of course there's fish, there's critters of all kinds, and you've got that sludge that's squeezing up between your toes if you're barefoot or coming up over your knees because it's so deep. And I knew I was gonna have to face that. Not to mention, how do I set my focus? I want that lily pad to be in focus, but I don't wanna lose sight of those trees either. So how do I set my focus? And I wanna get a sunset shot. So what's that gonna change in the foreground in terms of my exposure? All of these things are cooking and going through my mind and, and I'm unsure of how I'm gonna attack this thing. But that's really been what's on my heart this week is stepping out of your comfort zone. How many times in the Bible have we read about people who had to face their fears and insurmountable fears and trust God and go out on faith? And it's the same for us when we just trust Him. Doesn't it seem like He just sort of shows up right at our side and sort of helps us along the way? And sometimes He rewards us with being able to conquer. And I faced my fears. I ended up not going barefoot the second time. I tried that shot a few nights ago and the sledge going between your toes, not, not a good thing, not a good thing. And there's water moccasins out there. So it's just kind of crazy. So I got my snake boots this last evening and ventured out into that water and worked through those camera settings, tried some different things and ultimately ended up with a shot that I'm pretty proud of. God of angel armies, you're the power inside me. You're the prince of peace in the mystery. God of angel armies, you're the power inside me. You're the voice. Now I've learned if I ever want to do that shot again, and maybe I do want to take my tripod, I've learned. So sometimes you win sometimes you learn sometimes you conquer and sometimes you just get stronger right so i encourage you to take that camera face your fears punch fear in the face get out of your comfort zone and shoot more because it will come to you and you will conquer so guys i hope this video and this series has been helpful to you in learning the basics of photography and i hope it's been an encouragement to you to grab that camera and get out there and start shooting the more you practice these techniques and all these fundamentals, the closer you'll be to taking those amazing shots that you never thought possible. But if you have gotten some value from this video or this series, I wish you would subscribe to my channel and click that little bell so that you know every single time that I go live with another episode. And remember to click that like button and share this with your friends who may also want to learn photography. Now, if you have questions, I encourage you to ask me those down in the comments. I, I love answering questions and I want this to be an open discussion and a dialogue between us and give me questions if you want me to cover them in a future episode. On that note, I do plan to do another one in this series where I'll talk about some of the accessories for your camera, little tools and tips that I have that will help you get your camera ready and keep your camera clean, things like that, as well as answer some of your questions if I have an opportunity to do so. So until the next episode, I wish you the best of luck with your photography. Get out there and shoot some shots with me. And I hope that we can all grow as photographers as we explore God's creation with childlike wonder. And I'll see you again on the next episode. Have a great week. And if you haven't gotten enough of my voice today or just wanna learn more about photography, here come two more links that you can click on and watch more blissful photography tutorials with me. Thanks for watching, guys.